Break up this way. Uh, no, we're going to start off together. So the, the sort of the plan is uh, we'll talk a little bit outside the building. I'll probably start doing most of the talking. Uh, we'll talk about this wind tunnel for a second, and then we're going to go talk about this way, this set of wind tunnels, uh, and then we're going to go after sort of a little preparation. Then we'll actually go inside one of the test sections um, over to the nine by seven wind tunnel. Uh, let the bus go by. Scott's actually a, t a test engineer, so uh, as far as aerodynamic and, and how the tunnel works, he's much uh, smarter than I. Uh, I'm a data guy, so uh, I can talk about the, the data systems and, and the like. Um, uh, so we'll go into the facility, go into the control room, sort of show you what the control room looks like, then go into actually go what we call the dance floor and then into the uh, into the test section and uh, you can see what it's like inside a uh, supersonic wind tunnel but before we go into that one just wanted to talk a little bit about this facility so this is the um, what you see here is the largest wind tunnel in the world it's called the national full-scale aerodynamic complex when i came here and i came here in 1970 so i'm uh, i'm an old guy um, when i came here there was just this test section, which is the grayish building, sort of, that look, doesn't look like everything else. Uh, and it was a circular building. That whole section wasn't here, and it was called the largest wind tunnel in the world. So, so no, it was the largest wind tunnel in the free world. <laughs> so somebody, there was a, some tunnel in Russia, I guess. So somebody didn't like that distinction or something. So back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we added this test section that you see sort of sticking out uh, diagonally from the, the, the main building. And, and that became the largest wind tunnel in the world. And so what do I mean by large? Well, first of all, the, the, that test section is called the 40 by 80. It's 40 feet tall, 80 feet wide. Uh, it'll hold the Learjet hole, just to give you some sort of time, uh, you know, spatial uh, uh, reference. This test section is uh, 80 by 120, so it's 80 feet tall, 120 feet wide, holds a 737. So if any of you have flown, flown on Southwest, you know, they use 737s, that's what you've got here. Um, back in the early 2000s, we had a, a plane, a, a, something called a Dash 8, which is a, a prop plane equivalent size to a 737. It actually flew into the run, to, on uh, Moffett Field. That we have, you know, runway back there. Actually landed here at Moffett. Was defueled, tugged over to the test section, and this big yellow crane that you see actually lifts, lifted up the model. The, the wall of the building actually is a set of doors which opened up. The crane put it in the model in the tunnel, gently plopped it down, uh, ran the test. Doors open, take it back out, tug it back off to the, uh, to the runway, fuel it up, fly it out. So a real plane, again, 737 size. Uh, now, if you, any of you are in the supercomputer building, which is uh, sort of down there, and you're sitting in your office looking out the window, imagine what it's like to see a plane being pulled down the street uh, right by you. But, uh, you know, one of the things you do when you live in an aeronautical center. So this is again the largest wind tunnel in the world. Um, however, it's, it, its use, it currently is being run by the Air Force. So NASA used to run it. Uh, it is primarily used for helicopter research uh, because it's a relatively slow wind tunnel. Um, the 40 by 80 section runs about 300 knots. I think that's about 350, 345 miles an hour. The 80 by 120 runs uh, about 100 knots, so about 115 miles an hour. Uh, so it's a relatively slow tunnel, uh, but is ideal for helicopter research. Uh, we've also tested, uh, on my watch when I was still over here, uh, we tested a, um, the, the Mars parachute. The parachutes they use for the Mars lander. Uh, it turns out that the, while the atmosphere, uh, while the 
at the uh, lander goes at a much, much higher speed. The atmosphere is much thinner, and so uh, the forces on the on the parachute were could be matched here in this facility, and it turned out to be a very nice facility. You had the tunnel running at speed, I think it was about 80 miles an hour. You shoot the parachute out, and literally it was a shot, uh, and then it opens, and they had about five or six different um, different models of parachutes or types of parachutes to see which one would open, open properly, not tear, all those kinds of things. And they, they then narrowed it down to a couple uh, and then finally made their selection and it all worked. So uh, we, we can count that as a successful test. Uh, we've also done uh, tractor trailer trucks. Uh, so we don't usually do cars, but in the case of a tractor trailer truck, they were interested in the turbulence. Um, Let's see, I think in this one it was the turbulence in between the cab and the, uh, and the trailer. Uh, that turbulence ends up causing uh, a, a drag, which then causes a, a fuel, fuel loss, and so they were trying to make it more efficient. Uh, we've been other tunnels, we've actually looked at the back end uh, and seen if there's a way, because I mean, if you pull a tractor trailer, there's a vacuum created, air has to fill it, that causes a bit of a tug back on the, on the, ca on the trailer. And so they were also using, looking for ways to make it more uh, fuel efficient that way. So primarily helicopters, but some other oddities uh, as well. Uh, so why don't we now, yes? General question, isn't the direction of the wind tunnel, isn't that perpendicular to gravity though, in real life? Uh, well, in real, here it's perpendicular to gravity too. I mean, the air gets sucked in from that end, uh, if you talk about this test section, uh, and gets blown out in uh, your building uh, yeah. over by 233. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm just thinking of the parachute, though. The parachute's going, you know, against the wind, and the gravity would be this way. Whereas on Mars, they'd be in the same direction. Yeah, that, the, the, they were looking really at forces, and they figured out that that wasn't, a, you know, the, wasn't a factor. Um, the 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 test section, the inlet here is about the size of a football field on its side, so it's pretty impressive if you happen to drive around the front of that. Uh, but the airspeed right at that inlet is about 10 miles an hour, uh, so we don't suck in birds. Uh, <laughs> we do, however, suck in gnats. At the, you know, in the in the summer in particular, a um, a late afternoon test gets a lot of little bugs uh, uh, on the model, so. Uh, that is can be a problem, uh, but in general, not. So now we're going to walk. Yes, we no. have a lot of debuggers here. <laughs> uh, just reminded me. <laughs> Very good. Well, well, well placed. Uh, excellent. So we'll be counting on you shortly. Um, so uh, any questions before we move over to the high speed tunnels? Okay. So I'm going to. We're going to walk over right over here. You'll see the NASA meatball and. Uh, talk about the high speed one coming. One, well, I think we'll argue that we're number one and two in the world. So these are the two best wind tunnels in the world. We have one of them. Um, so what we have here are three test sections, uh, all running off of the same drive. So you can run one, only one at a time, but we, we run, you can start up the tunnel and either run the 11 foot test section, which is a transonic test section goes from 0.2 Mach to one and a half Mach, so one and a half times the speed of sound. The nine by seven uh, is a supersonic wind tunnel, so it starts at one and a half, just where the 11 foot ends, and goes to two and a half. And then over here we have the eight by seven, not currently in use, but available, and it goes from two and a half to three and a half Mach. So we can go from essentially the same model you could put in the 11 foot, all, and test it from 0.2 Mach all the way up to 3.5 Mach. Uh, I don't know that it's been done, but we certainly commonly, even today, test in the 9x7, I mean in the 11 foot and the 9x7. So there are oftentimes tests which will run in one test section and break down the model, move it across, and run in the, run in the second test section. Uh, as far as uh, this is a tunnel that will run continuous, so you can start it up and sort of run to your heart's content. Uh, it takes a lot of power. I mean, we're, we're talking about running at, you know, typically 
Uh, I mean, the normal rain test range is 0.9 times the speed of sound is the typical testing range, 0.9. Yep. And so, and, and you can also pressurize the tunnel, so you can go up to two atmospheres, so you can make the air more dense, or you can evac evacuate it and make it less dense. So power-wise, this uses uh, well over 100 megawatts of power. Um, depending on the configuration, I think it can go up to, a, in the 11 foot, I think it can go up to about 150, 160? Yeah, 176. Okay, 176. Which, just to get a frame of reference, um, you know, City of Mountain View, you know, as much electricity as the City of Mountain View. The 9 by 17 goes even, uh, uses even more power. I think it's up to about 192, if I, last number I heard. So that's the City of Santa Clara. Uh, so we really suck power big time, uh, but we're lousy uh, customers for the electric folks because we turn on the tunnel, we turn off the tunnel. So unlike the city of Mountain View, which is, you know, sort of continuous. So uh, we, we have, have historically scheduled with the power folks when we're going to run, uh, when, you know, how long we're going to run uh, in the summers, particularly several years ago when electricity was sort of uh, tight. We were forbidden from running from uh, uh, essentially noon to eight o'clock at night. So we abuse our staff by um, starting a, a, a shift at 8 o'clock and going till 4 o'clock in the morning or 4.30, have the other shift start at 4 and go till about noon. Uh, so again, double shifts here tend to be night shifts, you know, sh a swing and, and grave, if you will. Uh, in the winters, we're uh, a lot better. Uh, we can run uh, day, and, and day and swing. Typically, a test will run two shifts. We have, on a very rare occasions, run three shifts. Uh, so we'll do a 24-hour cycle, right. but the tunnel can handle it uh, no problem. I assume it's not running right now. It is not right. You would know if it's running. <laughs> uh, so, and in fact, uh, particularly if, you, if the 9 by 7 was running, it's very loud. Uh, we'd all be wearing hear, hearing protection, which is, again, you know, if you live in this environment, much like, you know, you guys have sort of the tools of your trade. Around here, one of the tools, when I was a branch chief over here, and I retired about seven years ago, uh, you know, you always had a pair of uh, earplugs in your pocket. I mean, that was sort of a requirement, you know, the, to walk around. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of big safety issues. There's lots of power. You worry about lockout, tagout. So all sorts of things that are, you know, sort of unique to this place. Um, again, if you look over here, as Scott mentioned, uh, virtually every commercial thing that you've flown has been tested here. You know, all the Boeing aircraft, the before that Douglas, uh, all the military, you know, the Navy in particular tests here a lot. Uh, the Air Force tends to go to the one in Tennessee that the Air Force runs, surprise. Uh, but the Navy comes here, the, the Marines will come here. Uh, so you get those military aircraft. Uh, and then we have had the, sh you know, we're a NASA place, so we have tested the shuttle and, and uh, we do other testing now for the new uh, uh, exploration uh, initiative. Uh, we'll do some of those kinds of testing as well. Uh, why, questions? Why can't you do this with computer uh, uh, okay, simulation? Good, good question. Why can't, so, you know, back in the, as the uh, NFAC, the, uh, not, excuse me, as the uh, NAS came up, the supercomputer facility, and computational fluid dynamics came, came about, the word was wind tunnels are dead. You're going to replace all of that with you know, computational uh, capability. And uh, it turns out, while many things are being done now com you know, computationally, and there's some, even some cool things done inside the tunnel that look like that, the, these folks still, there's still a validation needed with a model and uh, no uh, airframe manufacturer that I know of is willing to just go with the computational models. They still want to test here. Uh, it's, it's, they're, they're very serious about it. Uh, Boeing will come here uh, you know, time and time again uh, to make sure that they have tested on their model and tested the different uh, configurations. So I don't... I, I don't know if you have a better answer of why computate, why wind tunnels still... Uh, we have the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they think of wind tunnels now as doing more refinement rather than gross, you know, configuration. So now we'll, we'll do refinement of wingtips or, or nacelles or things like that. So 
there's still going to be wind tunnels around in the future because we have the right answer. So, yeah. Uh, kind of of interest is now Boeing has a wind tunnel of their own. They have a transonic wind tunnel. It's um, don't quote. Well, you're going to quote me anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of a McDonald's kind of wind tunnel. I mean, you know, it's it's. Uh, oh, oh, wait, no, wait. Gosh, <laughs> okay. It's you know, it's it's a good wind tunnel. It's not a high quality wind tunnel, but that's okay in the beginning of a of a airframe construction. I mean, you're you're designing an airframe. In the beginning, you just get you know, getting close enough is you know, close is good as you're sort of laying out the design. When when you really want to, you know, when you really need to do that, f those final refinements, uh, that's when you show up here, because we we do have, uh, by all accounts, all uh, we have the uh, the highest quality. Again, Tennessee guys may disagree, but certainly between the two of us, we have the highest quality, and that's when you're going to eke out those final drag counts, the the final efficiencies that you might get. What makes a wind tunnel? High quality. Okay. But how can we tell the difference? Uh, lam uh, the straightness of the flow. Okay. So you know how how pure the flow is, the laminar in the flow, let uh, the least amount of turbulence. Uh, so again, uh, having good quality flow, and then the quality of the instrumentation and the data system, you know, the data collection process. Uh, I think are probably the two things. We also think, and I think uh, we have also. Uh, understood uh, during what were some lean times for NASA the concept of customer service and so we really put a lot of effort into providing a high quality service uh, our customers uh, I mean if, if you are a customer and walk over to a wind tunnel operator and say hey the printer paper is out he'll go fix it he won't say well that's somebody else's thing so we we really have ingrained in everybody uh, the idea uh, that we have a customer, uh, we're not just a government entity that provides a facility, but we really do understand the concept of customer service and we, we, we have a feedback session with the customer at the end of the test and my, the best thing I had uh, happen was we had a customer came in, end of the test, we actually have them fill out a form and then show up on the last day of the test to talk about what they filled out and the first comment out of the customer is, well, he, had, he was a repeat customer. He said, well, all the things I raised last time were fixed. So it was very obvious. We also listen to the customer when they, they tell us that something uh, needs to be uh, improved. So uh, that's the other aspect. Now, I was just at the uh, Boeing facility where they're making 787s. So obviously, a 787 isn't going to fit in here. Right. right? They, make, they make high precision, 2%, uh, 5% five, models of those things to fit in the 11 foot. Uh, we also are not cheap is the other thing. Uh, our price now is probably under 4000 Is it? A little higher. A little higher? 4500 Oh, we're up to five. Not quite. Okay. So somewhere between four and $5,000 an hour plus power. So efficiency of the operation, again, is an aspect of how, why we're, uh, you know, why it's important for us to recognize, hey, the customer's putting out a lot of dollars for this facility. Uh, saving time, being efficient, uh, getting good data when they're here, uh, getting data that they can make real-time decisions. I mean, we run a test and somebody says, mm, something's happened here that I don't like. I'd like to go back and do it again or I'd like to refine my, my sweep or test conditions. Uh, we, we provide them data in real time so they can make those decisions and, and get a, be smart in their test uh, so that they really get the bang for their buck. Um, how much data do you generate during these tests? What's your data rate like? How much data do we generate? Oh, God. Terabytes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Depends on the type of data. If it's a dynamic data test where we measure dynamic pressures on the model, uh, terabytes. I mean, per just hour. How do you I mean, measure I, all of that? I mean, what's the, what are the instruments and how do you collect it? Is it all, is it visual? Like a, no. a smoke save, test that goes over the Save that top? question <laughs> for when we get in the okay. control room, because right. that's a good question for up there. I got another question. Do you have any engineering horror stories, like a model breaking loose in one of these things during one of these <laughs> tests? Okay, so the, the worst horror story is in that tunnel. Um, it was a Sikorsky, I think it was a Sikorsky helicopter. It was in the 40 by 80. Uh, it broke its strut. Uh, so it started to break off. Uh, a wing, a, a, a propeller blade snapped and actually went 
flying in the, at that time, this is back in the 70s, when fl actually flying into the control room, which at the time was at the level of the uh, test section. <laughs> <Tease that. laughs> yeah. You, you inferred properly. Um, uh, another test in there that I, that I uh, a, um, a model in the tunnel, and there was a, um, a loose floor plate. So here we have, you know, the tunnel's running, the, and all of a sudden the floor plate lifts up and then starts flying down the tunnel and, and dented it in several places. So um, here, I mean, the, the worst eyewitness is just parts coming off a model, which is, a, again, a big deal. Uh, three and a half mock, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that three and a half mock? That's like a bullet, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, in this case, it was only it was it was at the 11 foot, so it was um, under you know under a mock and a half. But even at, at that speed, I mean, so we we are very concerned about wh whenever there's a, um, a a model change, you actually look at the model, make sure everything's still there. We do visually look at the model, but primarily not for, for data, but for just that safety question. Um, Cool. Did I miss anything there? I think. No, no, you're right. And we have things that catch. I mean, we have grids that will catch some of the uh, the stuff that might fall off. So you're referring to the compressor that catch your screen to catch any parts that might fall off the model, but any kind of screws would still go through that. And so we go to great extremes to make sure that nothing falls off the model. That the safety factors are extremely high. Um, the dynamic pressure on the models is, you know, uh, an 11 foot is about 2,000 um, pounds per square foot. So you're talking high strength material, little bitty things take on a lot of velocity, can do a lot of damage, and so losing parts is not, not good. So we always avoid and, that. And there's, there's, there's a, a guy here uh, on the contract uh, who reviews every test, you know, for just those kinds of things, you know, the, the quality of the model. So we, in essence, will reject certain models or you know designs because we just don't think they're going to survive and uh, i always find it interesting uh, it's a guy named harold reimer and uh, uh many years ago we we were doing some downsizing so we we started looking at you know sort of ranking staff from you know most important to least important the most important guy i mean somebody once said to the uh, contract site manager if it's you or harold nice to see you phil <laughs> i mean Here's a guy who essentially has a go/no-go -go, uh, authority on on a test, uh, and well respected, uh, well respected here at the center, but well respected by the customer community. Um, but every test will come in. We'll pr provide him the engineering drawings, a thorough analysis we be done by him or one of his folks to uh, ensure that the model will not break up during a test because of all the reasons that Scott said. It, 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 become, it, it not only does it mess up the test, but it could damage the facility. So we do have a, a self-interest in there as well. Any other questions? One more, are, are humans ever involved in testing inside things or anything? Uh, humans are involved in testing, but well, never in the test site. No, no. We have had uh, in the NFAC, I think there has been, well, the, the, the um, example of the parachutes the parachute would open, they would, then now the parachute's open, they would actually slow the tunnel down slightly to the point where, uh, so instead of 80 miles an hour, they'd slow it down to about 30 miles an hour, and then allow someone to walk in, I think he was tethered nonetheless, but allow him to walk in to actually look at, look at the, at the um, parachute and how it opened and whether there are any tears, uh, but certainly not here at any of these high-speed tunnels, no. Okay. Thanks. All right. We staffed by the, uh, the the Ames people, and the area over there is typically staffed by the customers. So we do have. I mean, these are million-dollar models. The customer has a tendency to want to see how the test is running, so they they'll be here for their uh, for their test. Uh, a minimum crew is five. Uh, so to operate a tunnel, you have to have at least five people. There are two tunnel operators. Uh, these are wind tunnel mechanics. Uh, nominally, one flies the tunnel, one flies the model, but that's not always the case. But that's sort of uh, the case. The uh, person who's, forget now if it's here, is someone like Scott. You have a test engineer, test manager. 
they are in charge of the test. They are the quarterback of the team. Test manager says what's being done, who's doing it, uh, what run schedule we're going to run. Uh, again, much like I use the football analogy quite a bit, much like a football team, there is a playbook that's sort of written out. We're going to run these sort of runs, this thing, uh, and you follow the playbook. Uh, to a large extent, but in the middle of the test something comes up and you say, hey, we're skipping this run or we're moving on to this run or repeating that run. Uh, so the test engineer is the quarterback, decides what we do, everybody follows along with what the quarterback says. If not, we all get in trouble. Uh, and I don't mean by penalties, we, we have problems with the, with the facility. What would, what would the engineers be seeing on these screens if it was running right now? So again, different things for different people. So if you are a, a tunnel operator, you're going to be seeing how the tunnel itself is performing. Uh, uh, you're going to be seeing uh, uh, speed of the tunnel, uh, pressure of the tunnel, power being used by the tunnel. Anything else that... Yeah, you'll see um, on all these screens will be something, some will be video of the model, some will be facility control systems, some will be data flows, data plots over here. You'll have balance monitoring or instrumentation monitoring diagrams that we look at dynamic and static loads on the model. So every bank of screens will be full with something pertinent to the people sitting in front of it or repeated screens around. So if I'm walking around, I can find what I want quickly and, and see what's going on. And the, uh, so I've talked about three people. I've got the test engineer who is the quarterback. Uh, I've got the two tunnel operators. And then there are two other people. There's an instrument tech and a data tech. And those typically were out of my branch or what my, was my branch. So the instrument tech is actually looking at the raw data coming off of the sensors uh, from, the, uh, from the model, looking at the quality of data, noise, electrical kinds of things. Uh, and uh, the, the data tech is looking at the performance of the computer and the computations in particular. So it's not so much whether, you know, what the load is on the computer, uh, though some of that is reviewed, but really are the computations being, being run? And typically uh, the, the data system, the way the data system works um, is there is a continue, we do continuous data collection. So we're constantly collecting data. Uh, the model in most cases uh, runs in what's called a, uh, uh, a pitch pause mode. So we start off at, at let's say, minus, minus two degrees, uh, take a data point. I'll say what that is in a second. Then it will move up to, uh, move up by half, half a degree. So we're minus one and a half, one, and we'll sort of sweep at an angle of attack. It's a typical example. And at each point, there's a, a, a interaction between the control system and the data system that says, hey, we're on conditions take a data point, in which case it will then capture the next second's worth of data and store it away for, for prosperity, uh, even though it's continually going. Uh, and then say, we're done, and then the control system will then move the model to the next one, same sequence occurs. Um, there are some interesting things you can do if you're continuously collecting data. Uh, so one of the things you can do is, uh, um, one of the things that I think these folks uh, who worked for me were very clever, they were actually able to look at the certain criteria, because the, the airflow and things like that does have some variation, and selectively collect only that where the speed, the Mach uh, speed was at you know, 0.64 or whatever was the requirement at that particular data point. Or the angle, because there might be some bouncing in the model, the angle was exactly at the angle that they wanted. So they can do some intelligent data capturing, uh, which then improves the scatter that the ultimately the customer sees. So we, we, we've done some clever things in data collection uh, uh, as part of our, part of our effort. Uh, so again, typically five people. The, there is oftentimes a sixth person uh, from the government side or the NASA side, uh, which is a data engineer, which is looking at a much higher level of, of the data being collected. I mean, now really looking at some computations and the output of the computations. Uh, and, you know, uh, if you have questions, talk to Scott. He understands that stuff better than I. Um, 
but so that's typically the five or six people. Now the customer can bring uh, their own computers, they can bring their uh, own people, and so typically a customer will have three or four people on the shift, and they too will have someone who is the quarterback for their side. So again, they're the customer, so they can say, hey, we want to change the direction. They can't change the direction. They go to the test manager and say, hey, we've seen something, we want something done. Obviously, there's a lot of interaction, um, but uh, ultimately, the person who makes that final decision is someone like Scott, who is in that position. But uh, the customer certainly has a lot of influence on how we're going to collect the data, because ultimately, it's their data. So we, we want to make sure we, we do what, what they want. Watch everything. There's, there's this address is everywhere. The tunnel, so um, we're going to go in, and I'll go turn on the light, but go in and stay on the tarp. We try not to put our feet or shoes or anything on any of the painted surfaces. If you get a nick in the paint or a scratch, the shock wave will actually come off of that and cause problems. So we're very careful with our floors and walls. So um, while we're back here, we can talk about the instrumentation. <laughs> all the things that Herb talked about, pressures and balance forces and, and whatnot, all come back to this carousel where we use taper pins and all types of different connectors to connect our balance data or our balances and instrumentation from the model to our facility wiring which goes all the way into the control room to that um, instrumentation racks that you saw inside there. Um, on the left side on top and bottom we have high pressure air that we bring into the strut. This whole blade will move side to side depending on the angle of attack of the model and we actually can vary the pivot point of that. Wait, so and, where is the model? Okay, the model would be normally up front. Okay. Oh, okay. Alright. Taper here that the model steam that supports the model goes on to this taper. And models typically ride out in this area around the windows. And so we have cameras and whatnot over here in the windows to look at the model. Um, the monorail is just to help move in the models because they're gonna weigh with the steam support on the model itself, it'll weigh a thousand or two thousand pounds, so we need a way to get that in here. Um, so what you have up front here, I'm going to show you, is the asymmetric nozzle. So if you look, you see it diving down from the bottom. And if you look up to the side, you can see where there's yellow marks and, and scrape marks on the wall. Well, this whole floor, including what you're standing on and another 15 or so feet behind you, moves back and forth. So as it moves closer, it increases the Mach number as the throat decreases. Okay? So you'll have a, a shockwave come through, and the shockwave actually pushes past the model and goes pass down another 15, 20 feet down that way. So the air comes from that way and then hits the collector after it hits the, or the sensors after it hits the model? Well, it, well all the sensors are in the model. Okay. So you have cabling running back to there. So that's just the connection where we hook things up. So the model is out here in the flow, in the clean flow, and then what in a supersonic tunnel, after the shock wave, when you pass the model, it doesn't matter. The, the pressure waves aren't going to move forward. And so none of this really has any effect on the model or the data. Um, well, questions? How long does it take to get the tunnel up to speed? It takes a couple of minutes. Uh, you do the drive start and we came up to uh, 685 RPM. The flow continues to get faster and faster and then about 580 RPM. You'll see a shockwave actually come through here and you can see it go by the window, a little fog mist, and it just sweeps by the model. So uh, most of the time it's a very benign situation, but on some models it moves around quite a bit. But once you go supersonic, it gets real boring because there's no dynamics. The model just is rock solid 99% of the time. So there's really not a lot to watch, but the problem is because we have an asymmetric nozzle, we run our wings vertical rather than horizontal. Think about a low, or a flow coming up at an angle on a model puts a lot of force on it that we don't want. So we run them vertical. So alpha's like this, beta's like this. So the difficult part in this tunnel is once you go supersonic, no problem. We have starting loads that we calculate out and account for. But if you unstart the tunnel, that means that shockwave's coming back on your model. And if you're in a bad angle of attack, it gets exciting. So, <laughs> so running's not very exciting, but if things go bad, it gets exciting in a hurry. And so, um, so we have to really pay attention to what we're doing. Um, so like I said, this moves back and forth. In the 11 foot, this is vertical rather than horizontal. Um, this is called a knuckle sleeve. Um, I don't know if there's any other NASA facilities that actually have this. It's actually two conical sections that rotate within one another. 
So we can sweep out an arc of plus or minus 15 degrees. So it's a very unique system. Um, the people that design this tunnel are, are very intelligent, very good designers. Um, you'll find if you look in the records, a lot of the facility uh, calculations were on one guy's handwriting, on one engineering pad. He just you know, wrote everything out, one name on all the drawings. It was very impressive. Um, questions? <laughs> a lot of echoes. <laughs> when, uh, when we have our auxiliaries running and our makeup air compressors and everything, it's loud in here. It's, it's not so much that you can't communicate, but it gets loud in here. Um, so it, it's, it's, you know when you're running, you know when things happen, because it makes a lot of noise. Um, we use different types of instrumentation in here. The model is out here. The most important thing to know is the angle of attack. Well, we're not in a gravity plane, so it's a little more difficult. So we use a ferro arm, a digital um, inspection tool to reference off the walls and a floor to where the model is. So we actually take points on the floor, take points on the wall, create two planes, take points on the model at certain locations, and project lines down on the floor and get the angle of attack or the angle between the walls and the model itself so we know exactly where it's at. And then we can adjust our calculations to offset those angles and get it right. So doesn't attaching the sensors mess up the airflow over the object? Well, they're all, see the balances are inside the model. So typically the balance is cylindrical. So the model itself slides over the balance and gets pinned. And so all the forces go through that balance. And so all okay. pitching moment, rolling moment, everything goes through that. But the that. pressure's on the outside, that's where the paint comes in? Well, the pressure on the outside are little orifices, say, you know, they're, they're 40 thousandths holes, okay, with a very sharp lip on it. So the air is passing over it, it doesn't affect the data, it doesn't affect the airflow enough to, to impede any kind of flow. And so you're measuring that pressure. The pressure sensitive paint lets you have fewer pressure because it takes a lot of money to literally drill the holes and put a little channel, you know, lay a tube in, and it's quite expensive. So by having fewer pressures and then covering the whole model in pressure sensitive paint, which actually has turned out to be pink, um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it allows you to, to calibrate the pressure paint and also get uh, better fidelity over the whole model. So whether wingtips or, or fuselage wing junction, things of that sort, you're able to you know really zoom in on and, and get fidelity that you want. And you talked about if you, there's, there's no problems with the sensors or anything like that when you're supersonic because the shockwave doesn't go forward, but what if you're subsonic and the other tunnels are? It doesn't matter. Subsonic, it means that some acoustic noise can travel forward and backwards, but it's behind the model, so you know what happens back here is really not important. You, you can, if you look at sensors on the model, you can dynamic sensors, you can see the acoustic signature of the strut in the other tunnel, and you can see things like that. But, and we see blade passing frequencies, the compressor rotation speed and its harmonics. You see all those things on the dynamic data, but it doesn't affect, look at the spectra, you know what that is, you know what that so peak you is, right you can disregard it and go on. So you can sort out facility related items versus model related items. Very cool. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What, what's your, who are you? I'm Herb Finger. I used to be branch chief over here in uh, Wind Tunnel Data Systems, but now I'm retired and still working here at the center. I didn't really retire. Yeah. So Scientists here. don't retire, yeah. they just stop getting paid. That's right. yeah. <laughs> so I've been here for 40 years. Wait, we get paid? 40 years. Yeah. Gosh. And who are you? Because you, you were given part of the tour as well. Uh, my name is Scott Rich. I'm a test manager here. Very cool. So I uh, operate the tunnels and manage tests. So kind of like a project manager for yeah. Wind Tunnel Test. Yeah. He's the quarterback of a test. What's the coolest thing that you can tell us about? Because I bet you can't tell us about the coolest thing you've seen tests of the right, let, Let's let this gentleman in. Sorry. I, I mean, I just think we're, I tell you, the work atmosphere for me is the best because you have, you really are badge blind. So, I mean, the test manager is the test manager is responsible. I, they, I was asking, what's the coolest object you've seen tested here? Oh, you know, the coolest, the coolest oh. plane or coolest? No comment. Well, I mean, well <laughs> the ones that you can tell us. I about. mean, to me, the parachute was one of the coolest. Yeah. The Pretty Constellation cool. spacecraft, that's interesting. I mean, when you get into how it operates and the multiple jets and the interactions, I mean, that's that's all new. No one's doing that, so that, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was Pleasure. a real, real, I lived here all my life, and this is a real thrill, so yep. thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for it.